Good evening, everyone who is with us, everyone who sees us and hears us. Ukraine Forum News Agency and uh, all those who see us on YouTube. I'm Roman Romanum. I'm director for programs human rights in the International Renaissance Foundation. We are continuing with the marathon called 10 years of Russian aggression in Ukraine, a path to justice. And today, during this conversation, we will talk about the most recent events, what has started two years ago in February 2022. Well, 10 years that the Ukrainian society has lived through in, included the tragical events in Maidan 10 years ago, the invasion by Russian forces in uh, Crimea and occupation, then Donetsk and Luhansk regions, and two years ago, finally, in February 2022, the next stage of the Russian aggression started which is defined as a full-scale invasion. Let's try to transport ourselves to February 22. Let's remember those days before the 24th of February broadcasts by radio and television, internet, messages, we were very, there were very disturbed relations from different foreign partners of Ukraine, which uh, who said that the invasion was actually inevitable. We're not talking about the military part component today, but about the justice component. But what I remember from then now is the flow of uh, information about how Russia was preparing for this full-scale invasion. Let's remember the information about mobile crematoria. We also saw intelligence from different countries that they were preparing special camps where they would hold activists and other people who would not be agreeing with the Russian occupation and would be resistant to it. You all remember this flow of information and in spite of the fact that the war was there for eight years, many of us were rather skeptical about this, thinking, no, this can't happen at this scale. But I would like to share our perception and impression about that moment, about how we were perceiving those pieces of news and whether we were prepared for the level of cruelty that the Ukrainian society faced after the invasion has started, not only those people who lived on the territories that were occupied 10 years ago, but before we go to we proceed with the conversation, I'll introduce the participants. You see quite a cohort of beautiful people with whom we will talk for 90 minutes. Tetyana Pechonchik, who is head of the board of the Zmina Human Rights Center. Katerina Ohievska, who represents the civilians in, in captivity. NGO. Yuri Armash, head of, commander of the medical unit of the mechanized tank battalion who went through captivity and torture and he does know about cruelty not only from some information. Vladislav Gavrilov, 
He is the researcher and historian of Where Our People project. Zara Kozlieva, who is uh, the representative of Truth Hounds, and also Stanislav Petrenko from the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine. So you see how different these people are as far as their experience and activity are concerned. We have a unique opportunity to talk about our perception of the situation, how we work, and how con confident is our path to justice. Okay, I'll uh, try to. I ask about how realistically we viewed the level of brutality, cynicism, and cruelty that we saw and read about in uh, the information we got, but we haven't yet crossed the border, the line of the 24th of February. Who would like to start? whether the experience of the previous eight years was enough to think that there was no limit to brutality that uh, Russian would overstep. Tetyana, I remember those days very well. And yes, it was hard to believe that we would be facing something even more horrible than what we were working with. I remember very well, and we were talking about our this in our first panel, about Euromaidan, about murders there, and how each protester's death shocked us. And I was documenting them as Euromaidan source volunteer. We knew all those stories, we knew their families, we were telling about them quite a lot. And even during the Maidan, we thought that the scale of uh, crime was unprecedented, and it was hard to imagine something bigger. <clears throat> Then the Russian occupation of Crimea started, and our organization and other organizations started to document the violations of human rights in the occupied peninsula. Then the war in Donbass, and then the third wave of the Russian armed aggression, the full-scale invasion. And I say that the impunity of the crimes that the Russian Federation perpetrated was a fuel to flare up their intentions, and every stage of the aggression brought about uh, more and more of those crimes. We are now working with the detention of civilians now, uh, can compare the scale, and if we are talking about Crimea from 2014 to 2018, there were 43 forcible disappearances of activists, most of them Crimean Tatars. Some of them were later released. Some were tortured to death. And we don't have any use about some of them. And we have almost no expectations that they are alive. Then the aggression in Donbass started, and we remember the cellars, we remember the basements and the isolation, and we are talking about hundreds or even several thousand disappearances and deten detentions because uh, the representative, the speaker for the general prosecutor's office, is said that the procurator's office, prosecutor's office has. 2,000 cases started on uh, statements about this uh, detentions. We can't tell the exact figure now about 
the period after the after February 2022, but we can talk about thousands or even dozens of thousands of uh, people being detained very often incommunicado. They are being held both on the territory of the Russian Federation, Federation and on the occupied territories, and most of them go through torture as well. So we see that the wave of these crimes is expanding, and we see that for those crimes that were committed in Crimea, for instance, no one was punished, and the representatives of uh, paramilitary formation Crimean self-defense who were snatching our people together with the Russian military, they only got awarded for what they did. So we are talking now about, we have to talk about how to put an end to this impunity, because now we have an unprecedented wave of Russian aggression. We cannot even imagine that there's going to be something more than now, but the experience of the first three waves of aggression say that this can multiply and rise. We will come back, of course, to the impunity topic, but I think that even for our international partners, it becomes ever more evident now that it is very hard to provoke Russians with force because there was such a narrative. You don't have to provo provoke Russia. You don't have to disturb them. But what we saw in 2022 was that it is impunity that provokes Russia. The conviction that brutality and decisiveness in the bad sense of this word leaves unarmed those who are not prepared for this level of opposition. So in this respect, there's a very important question. Where do we seek justice when we're talking about a very influential state that is demonstrating something that violates human rights. And we have seen constant escalation of violations on the part of uh, Russia for the last 10 years. Unexpectedly for the Russian Federation, Ukraine engaged in a large scale armed resistance to this aggression. It was also notable, noticeable that on those territories that were occupied rather swiftly in February and March in 2022, average Ukrainian civilians started to offer and stage resistance. We saw Melitopol and Kherson during the first days of occupation, and I think what had to surprise quite a lot of observers as far as this war is concerned was how swiftly those large-scale Ukrainian protests disappeared. And in this sense, I think that we should talk about the magic wand in the hands of the Russian Federation that allows them to make those protests disappear. We saw multi-thousand pro-Ukrainian rallies in Simferopol and Donetsk before the occupation, but then they were disappearing. And of course, you should not be much puzzled about what the Russians were doing. I think the answer is just brutality. And I would like to switch over to the situation with civilians 
who found themselves under the Russian occupation machine. And I will pass the word to Katerina, who represents the organization Civilians in Captivity. Of course, we know that the Russian Federation has brought about a very sad common interest that unites people. But this is very important that even in very complicated circumstances, the interaction is preserved and the actions are organized if we are talking about the protection of people who are in a very vulnerable condition under the control of uh, occupation authorities. I'd like to start with my own story because I faced with the experience of uh, civilian detention personally on the 24th of uh, February. I and my boyfriend were in Chernihiv. Then we heard explosions and we went to a settlement not far from the regional center and we thought that we won't be disturbed there but on the 28th of uh, february they occupied the settlement of mikhailo kutsubinsky and on the 4th of march the russian military came to our house they wanted to check our documents and our personal mobile phones after this procedure they took away my boyfriend, his older brother, and his mother. But in 30 minutes, minutes I was walked under the barrel of a machine gun to Makita. I saw that he was putting his clothes on. As I was later told, this was a checkup whether he has some tattoos. They made me kneel beside him and they were asking a lot of questions about ukraine about how we found there and then they took me several meters away and a russian military aimed his machine gun rifle at mikita my boyfriend and said that i will kill him now and you stand away so that the blood does not spill on you and then you'll come and say goodbye to him. I did believe him because it was so real. Then I was taken to a house and in 10 minutes I saw that Makita was not there, my boyfriend, and we were told that he won't, he wasn't coming back and that he is going to be sentenced to 15 years of uh, imprisonment. We asked, will you take him to Russia? And they said, no, he will serve this sentence in Ukraine. And we understood that they were so convinced of their rightful actions that they thought that this will happen. Almost two years have passed since then. We don't know where he is, how he is, some exchanges are happening. Some people are lucky to get to know about their near and dear. Sometimes this concerns civilians, sometimes military. We have no information whatsoever. If you take our organization, we are in existence for almost two years, officially one year. We take part in every meeting with NGOs, we are talking about civilian hostages, and I must tell you that the number of civilian hostages is not known at the moment. If we take what the Ombudsman Office says, it's about 20,000 people. If the register of the Minister of the Interior, then they have another number. And we understand that even now, people are being detained on the occupied territories without any reason. You just can walk or 
look at Russian military not in the way that they like, and you're being detained. We have raised the issue with the working group about civilian hostages so that they are considered a specific issue. We were told that there's a resolution to be signed soon. However, since December 2022, this working group has not been in action and the resolution has not been signed for the hostages this time flies very fast because they are being tortured as the military are over the entire time of exchanges over these two years only 150 civilian hostages were returned to ukraine and we know about 1500 civilian hostages for sure our ngo unites the families of uh, almost 400 such hostages. We address international organizations. We are grateful to our human rights defenders who help us. I think that this, this issue lacks exposure, and we do hope that the fourth point of peace starts to work and we will be able to return our civilian hostages. Thank you, Katarina, for sharing this personal sad experience. Of course, these are horrible memories of our, this period of acquaintance with uh, direct, uh, direct acquaintance with Russian occupants. But it is very important that all the families touched upon by this tragic event are, being, are joining their forces. And of course, this is the task for the entire Ukrainian society and for the civilized world in general, who consider that this is inadmissible to treat civilians in this way. And we have to find a way how to free and return those people. But of course, understanding that they control now more than 3.5 million Ukrainians on the occupied territories, they have a resource to take hostages, civilian hostages, almost endlessly. And Ukraine does not have any intention to take civilian hostages, and in this context we have to find a legitimate solution which gives us grounds to hope for the mass release and return to Ukraine of these civilian hostages. So after within this marathon we will probably talk about possible ways to influence this situation but let's now talk about another experience that thousands of Ukrainians are facing now who have taken up their arms and started to resist the Russian aggression with the weapons in their hands. When I see this pieces of information, sometimes, you know, these uh, daily communiques from the Russian Defense Ministry is that they do not use the words soldiers, officers, or military. They only tell gunmen. Quite a strange terminology under the conditions when they for at least two years have launched the, mm, the biggest armed conflict on the European con continent since the Second World War. And they talk about gunmen de facto 
the Russian Federation does not recognize this status of this international armed conflict, which often means that they ignore the immunity of combatants and the guarantee is that the countries of civilized world assumed under the Geneva Conventions. Regrettably, thousands of people are being taken prisoners, I mean the military, and they are being treated in very different ways. We have Yuri here, who personally knows about Russian captivity, about the treatment that our military received there, about what happens there, and how they behave in relation to thousands of Ukrainian prisoners of war. So maybe we should hear this part of the story and what the Ukrainian society lives through. Hello, everyone. You know, there's quite a lot of information, a lot of answers, and uh, we will have more answers. There's a lot of questions. Everyone is interested in uh, how they treat our military, and it is different when you are in captivity, when you are freed from captivity. However, I would like to first of all tell you about the civilians, civilians and how they are being treated, about how they are being treated when they are being detained or when they are taken hostage, prisoners. I don't want to give you some information that will make you despair. Why despair? Because the Russians are not interested in exchanging civilians, regrettably, and they do not consider this for some reason. There is a priority as far as the military are concerned because they understand that Ukraine will be more interested in uh, returning a military person who can be brought back to the ranks of the military and will continue to serve. So I want to tell you that the desire to live of those civilians who are in captivity, it diminishes with every passing day. I have faced this. There were numerous cases of suicides. There were numerous cases of torturing civilians the same way they torture military, no one there distinguishes between civilians and military. They only make a difference when they hear that you are an officer or a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic or a person from the mine throw, uh, mortar crew, where they actually sustain the heaviest losses. And of course, torture is different. The torture is different because no one never thought and no one has known that a person we are we call them orcs, but we should understand that they are living bodies, that they are people, that they are 
capable of this torturing, physical torture, moral torture, and many people have heard about this, but there are all also sexual to torture, whether you are a woman or a man. What I've seen in Novakakhovka, they also raped children. And it's true, not many people take, talk about this, and not many people are prepared to hear this, but in reality this is what's happening. And the information that we had in captivity, they were, we were told that the civilians will be exchanged in the very end, when Russia gains its purposes. They are not the priority, the civilians. However, I Even when I was in Novakakhovka, I saw how the civilian exchanges were taking place and who was in those exchanges. Those were not those people who, like Katerina told us, those were officials because, who were exchanged because there was a priority to exchange officials. So we can ask each other why, how, and for me, the most regrettable thing is, and I cannot find peace with myself with this, but when I was telling the international and Ukrainian organizations about civilians and military who, because of being forced and tortured, were on the edge of uh, committing a suicide, of taking their own lives. And I was talking not just about a number, I was talking about specific people with military ranks and every data. All that I have, all I know the, about the people who are in captivity, but no one is paying any attention to this. Why? I can ask this question as well. Why? I cannot understand this. I don't know what has to happen. I don't know what can make to look with your eyes open at the situation, to look at it globally. I think that we will come back to this topic because there's another topic and the problem with which we are in Ukraine on our own land Another issue. Okay, thank you so far. Thank you, Yuri. I think that, first of all, it is very important that you were able to come back to Ukrainian soil, and it's uh, there's an opportunity to talk about justice and the justice and about how to look for it. And I think that your speech is an eloquent proof of the fact that people who have gone through the trials that the war brought would hardly expect the and uh, agree with the justice that they do not believe in. I think that later when we hear the stories of the people who have lived through the hardest times and hardest moments, it would be important for us to move our conversation to some other dimension and talk about where we should look for justice and what are the paths 
to this justice, we cannot influence the intentions and hopes of the Russian Federation until they, while they are perpetrating their crimes on our territory against both civilians and military, there is a glimmer of hope linked to the unblocked exchanges recently, but we understand that many more people are under the control of the aggressor than where, where we were able to return. And every time this is a huge dilemma, who can join the list, who cannot, and how the negotiations are being conducted. I'm sure that this is a huge issue of very complicated moral dilemmas from different points of view, and I think that Yuri was very eloquent in describing this, in describing the chain of other complicated issues. And now I would like to invite Mr. Vladislav, who is a member of the NGO PR Army, those who are publishing the stories, the scale of these events, and they try to increase the support for any efforts aimed at the restoration of justice so that these efforts may be implemented. I know that the scale of uh, coverage of different audiences is rather convincing. However, so far, we cannot convert this into large-scale success stories for those people who are now in captivity, who are being tortured, who, are, who cannot contact their near and dear, or can return. I'm not even mentioning the more large-scale justice for the entire population of Ukraine. So what do we have to do to change the flow so that personal tragedies result in successful solutions in the maximum number of cases? Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's true. It's a very complicated topic, especially about the suffering of civilians as a result of the large-scale invasion, really the largest-scale war on uh, European territory since World War II, and the different scale of uh, crimes that Russia is committing in Ukraine. I would like to dwell on mass deportations that I take in part. According to the Human Rights Ombudsman's data, at least 2.8 million people were deported from the occupied territories, and hundreds of thousands of them may be children. At the moment, we know about more than 19,000 children who have been deported, and the number of those whom we managed to return is small in comparison. And of course, there are elements of genocide and military war crimes. And we see that the Russian Federation is cynically violating all international acts and conventions, all the laws that can be violated. When we are talking about this to the international community, we see that this is the largest scale crime since World War II. Recently, I have lectured the students of the of a Swedish university I was thinking how to tell them that Ukraine has to be close to them. And you know, this happened in history in Baltic countries, for instance, when people were deported from Baltics to Siberia and then to Far East, and they had not opportunity to come back when the ethnical Germans 
were deported. They were allowed to come back to return only in 1970s. And of course, during the 30 years of deportation, a lot of them have died. Same happens to Ukrainian citizens now. When Russia deports them, they do not have plans to return them. They are hiding the information. And we know that we have discovered more than 60 camps. There were concentration camps during the Soviet times, and there are new type of camps now. And the situation is especially grave where children are concerned because they try to russify, uh, militarize them as soon as possible. They involve them into different paramilitary organizations with the aim of directing them against Ukraine. And we know a young man from Donetsk, he is 21 now, after he was educated in the so-called paramilitary organization UN Army. He has now joined the Russian forces and, which, and takes part in combat against Ukraine. That's why we should return such people as soon as possible. That's why we should place civilian return exchange to high priority. We see that Russia does not want to return those people. We have to have an international legal mechanism and the pressure from the international community to return those people to Ukraine. And what we were talking about right now, if we know that only less than 400 children were returned out of the number of more than 19,000 deported. You can imagine how, for how long we will be trying to bring them back if we do not involve our international partners in this. This is very important. This has to be the highest priority. I'd like also to say that the Russians are now, the Russian Federation are now preparing for the so-called election of the Russian president, and they are bringing people from the from Russia to the occupied territories where they will vote for the, in fact, a unlawful president of the Russian Federation. And this is another argument for us why we have to liberate the occupied territory and return our people from captivity. We probably understand that Ukraine will not be able to return people on the large scale on our own when the assimilation, indoctrination, Russification are within the Russian state policy and the role of Ukrainian voices on different international platform is to make these practices condemned. But of course, to make Russia change their policies is an immense task. And I think that PR army and other organizations are working about this. I think uh, on this, I think that the recent resolution of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has rather strictly condemned the practice of deportation of children from Ukraine and uh, trying to assimilate them. And the question is that there's no even a contour of the mechanism to legally return them. But this does not mean that we should reconcile ourselves with such a situation. And then I'd like to invite Zira Kuzliyeva to speak. She represents Truth Hounds. And since 2014, 
they've been documenting international crimes perpetrated in Ukraine, and Zero was also at the source of the creating within the Ukrainian prosecutor system of a special entity to provide answers to challenges that Ukrainian society faced 10 years ago when Crimea was occupied. What makes us believe that the way to justice does exist, although there is more and more injustice and these tragic history stories that we've been hearing everywhere may make many people despair how we should work, what we should pin our hopes on, are there any achievements and gains so that we take this as a support for our future struggle for justice? Yes. Thank you for the questions. I want to tell you that after the stories that we heard, it is rather hard to talk about the issues of justice, but you do understand that you does not do not do much when you think about the efficiency of your activity. You understand that it is very, very low compared to what is happening. And I think that we should understand why this happens this way, because the system of justice does work rather slowly, even when we are not talking about war, war crimes or international crimes. But when we are talking about international crimes, this happens even slower. However, we cannot reject this sole possible mechanism of uh, justice. But you have asked about whether we were prepared to cruel crimes perpetrated after the 24th of February. I'd say that as a person who has known this since 2014, I was not surprised because in Crimea, in the east of Ukraine, in 2014, 2015, everyone who took part in those violations know that since then they were doing the same as now. And I think that after the February 24, this has become even larger in scale because those responsible for those crimes were not and are not punished until now. And this is the rhetorics of uh, negotiations, the rhetorics of uh, trying to find another way besides beside the just punishment, but this has not led to stopping any of the violations. And it is very important also to remember whether this concerns one person or 80 person does not make a difference. For instance, if those who are guilty of torturing Rishat Ameto, for instance, the level of the cruelty of torture was not less than in Bucha or anywhere else. So this is a very tough challenge, but I think that we understand how important it is that the guilty are brought to justice and are punished. And it is important to show to other people that they will face the same consequences. And when we detain and arrest and the first guilty, and they will start to ser serve their sentences because they are war criminals, but not the quasi-legitimate administration representatives, then we will see some 
results because I remember from our own experience that any punishment would be instrumental in bringing down the level of cruelty, if not stopping. And of course, the number of crimes is growing. After the 24th of February, the key element is that the international community supports us much more compared to earlier. They understood that this is not the internal conflict. This is the issue of impunity for the crimes that bring about new crimes. And I think that our arguments are now irrefutable. And uh, this is what happens. And the scale of Russian crimes have reached also the people who do not come across this every day. And I think that a success here is real, is possible, and many people who have been engaged in this for 10 years have not lost their inner force to participate in this marathon. And it's also about today's marathon. Even if people are not tired to every day talk about the ratification of the Statute of Rome, then we do not have other choice. This is a very direct way with no stepping back. There's some positive change here and development here where the dimension of the internal justice system and the appearance of the specialized bodies of pre-court -investi pre investigation where they can help other bodies to fill some gaps. Since 2014, the public organizations, NGOs, were more mobile, faster. And even during the occupation period, truth hounds were able to conduct several missions undercover in the occupied Crimea, they were able to identify and document some violations that were later passed on to international bodies. So we should not lose what we have gained, and especially the basis of material evidence and testimonies. You cannot forget about what has happened before the 24th of February and uh, hope that everyone guilty will be punished for what has ha happened after the 24th. And this may be a deterrence. And if we are talking about this, then the isolation pri prison still works in Donetsk since 2014-2016. And those who are guilty of crimes there should be punished as well. This is very complicated, but this is very necessary so that those who are part of the opportunity to affect justice feel their responsibility for this. We work on this every day. If you are engaged in delivering justice, you can sort of immerse yourself too deeply into purely legal matters, but you should come back to the human dimension. NGOs are working with national legal enforcement, law enforcement bodies. I understand that we are working on the institutional capability of uh, judiciary. We, as an organization, work with our law enforcers and prosecutors, and we take part in judges' training. We have partners with whom we contact the bodies in other countries. So I want to believe that 
those efforts are not in vain and the events like we have today help to not get despaired and to move along to the result until it is achieved. So today we observe an anniversary of a mass shootings of Maidan of the Heavenly Company, but the people with whom we are we continue to fight for democracy. You cannot forgive what has happened, and that's why you cannot stop what you are doing. Thank you, Zira. Really, you cannot sit on your hands. On the other hand, we have become used to living in pluralistic democratic society where probably the majority of issues are being viewed differently by NGO activists or state structures. Uh, they are different more often than not. However, what Katerina and Yuri have told us, they are different, but they uh, tell us that even if we multiply our efforts by 10, they would not be sufficient to provide for a minimally acceptable level of justice. Ukrainian investigation bodies and prosecutors' bodies are in a unique and complicated situation. On the one hand, we are talking about 10 years, and the society may ask, may well ask, how large scale the answer was, how adequate the answer was of the law enforcement and judiciary system for the injustice that was there. On the other hand, there's a question about what is the scale of tasks that Ukrainian law enforcers and investigators face after the full-scale invasion. And sometimes I think that people are tempted to say that anyway it's impossible to guarantee hearings and prosecution for every crime. But on the other hand, if we take large-scale conflicts of the last period of time, as usual, the efforts of the national legal system were not full-scale, and the international community was looking for ways to show that there's no total injustice. I think about Iraq, I think about Syria, but in Ukraine we have a functioning in state, and everyone says that most of the work should be done by the Ukrainian justice system. We understand the circumstances, we understand the scale of problems. However, as of today, the work is being done in very different spheres and directions, and I think it's right to involve Stanislav Petrenko now, who represents the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine and the Department of uh, Counteracting the Wars, the Crimes in Conditions of Armed Conflict. So, how can we win over the wave of brutality and crime that Ukrainian society has faced and where our opponents, adversaries, are sure that we won't be able to win over this wave. Thank you. The course of the discussion that we are hearing now is rather different from a purely legal event or when we are analyzing the legal side of the full-scale invasion and legal uh, challenges that we face. Of course, there's a huge personal requirement for justice now, 
and their work both in personal and in very global dimensions, it is hard to answer some questions that are not based on any law. I would say that we should measure our efforts and our desires by the level that we see as the ideal that we should attain. You should not give any promises that you will catch and condemn every criminal. Not a single international justice tribunal was able to provide for such a state of things. And the matter is not about whether all the criminals were caught, but uh, the matter is about whether the justice was meted out in all the cases. So I think that this is the case not only for legal community or law enforcement bodies, but also for the civil society of Ukraine, where the right to truth is concerned. We can operate and quote figures about how many crimes were committed, about how many people were brought to justice, but probably this number will never be self-sufficient to close the entire global requirement or demand, and there will always be a step that might have been taken to do more. However, I am convinced that the Ukrainian state is capable of restoring justice. After all, every investigation action, every criminal case are directed at preserving part of the truth in the stories of our people about what has happened on our land during the full-scale invasion, how people were surviving in these circumstances, how the people were fighting, and how people were facing injustice and are facing injustice even now. So I can stress that the dynamics of the Ukrainian state is aimed in the right direction, no doubt about this. You mentioned the crime of deportation, and we can say that the fact that the ICC, within the record short time, has issued a order to arrest Putin and Lvova Belova is a, a very good success. Maybe this does not, of course, satisfy the demand that Putin be put in headcuffs and brought to The Hague. But there's a stamp of international criminal on him. So such stories about the success of the system of justice remain in your memory, in your chronicle. However, I should at the same time stress that the investigation of uh, international crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine is, first of all, the responsibility of Ukraine herself. Yes, the international organizations help. They assume part of uh, responsibility, but it is uh, not pro appropriate to wait that someone will come and do our work instead of us. It is Ukrainian prosecutors and civil society that should act in order to attain this. NGOs are staging field missions, media covers this, and I would once again stress the message that the way to justice is measured by the answer whether every one of us feels that they are in their proper place and whether they put efforts, apply efforts to the general effort. So I think that we are on the right track, even in spite of the complications that we have to face. 
Yes, not a very habitual answer to the complicated question from the representative of a state institution. We are more used to figures and numbers. However, we are now conducting a discussion which is very hard, which is very difficult. And of course, the issue of justice is not measured by figures. It is in intentions. It is in the scope of work coming from different directions. And I think that the command by Stanislav brings us beautifully to the second stage of the conversation where I would like everyone to participate about our understanding of the way to justice. If we talk sincerely, we all understand that brutality is more efficient than justice. In order to act in a just way, we have to adhere to some guarantees and standards, but when you cross it out and you act brutally, then you very soon gain the result that you count on. And the, when you face injustice, we are looking for the answer. What is the path to the restoration of justice? And I think that the speeches that we have heard now, at least I am brought closer to understanding that you should not wait for the swift way to justice. It is uh, a uh, long and winding road, and we are not probably within the time and space where it is possible. We have to understand that this path requires <clears throat> patience, insistence, and the fact that this justice has many answers. There's no one single mechanism of restoring this justice. And we also understand that there's no fast mechanism. And when people feel the scale of tragic consequences that we as a Ukrainian, the Ukrainian society face, especially those individually who's near and dear, whose family are in captivity or whose houses are being shelled or bombed or the settlements are occupied. I think that these people are hard to understand that this uh, way to, to agree with the fact that this way to justice can be very long. But do we regard the numer numerous ways of achieving the justice if we don't have a swift way to it? And this is the second part of our dialogue, whether we will have enough patience, whether we are prepared to accept other forms of the restoration of justice and not to expect some magic ways, whether we see this way in front of us, ahead of us. And very often on at international platforms, there are discussions that if peace is the main thing, then justice may be sacrificed for the sake of peace. How do we have to how do we have to treat this and what compromises we can arrive at, including our self our consciousness when those large scale tragedies are the day to day chronicle of life of the Ukrainian society. Let's try 
to talk about this, whether we will have enough patience and uh, whether these difficulties will stimulate us to drop our hands. Stanislav was not talking about figures today, but I visited the site of the Prosecutor General's office, and now 122,000 criminal cases have been launched as far as the violation of the laws and uh, customs of war have been violated. And we can ask whether how this correlates with the actual number of crimes since February 2022, whether it really reflects what is uh, actually happening in Ukraine. And from our field main missions, we see that it does not reflect the reality, at least in some components. We are coming to deoccupied settlements and towns and villages. We are talking to people who have not told law enforcement bodies about what has happened to them. And these people, for instance, uh, those cases are not about the violation of uh, human rights or war crimes. It's about the threat to national security. And uh, they do not account for torture. And the war goes on. It is a bloody war. We get new and new information about crimes, including, for instance, the latest news about execution of Ukrainian POWs, including the wounded POWs, or about the torture and the murder of a priest in Kalanchak and Kherson region. And besides, we do not have access to some of our territories, and after they are deoccupied, we can discover some new information, for instance, in Mariupol. But, of course, some of the facts will remain secret or unknown for quite some time, because people are just buried under the rubble of uh, their buildings. But Ukraine is, a num is an example of a country which, during the full-scale invasion, still retains institutions that preserve the ability to work. And there are, of course, courts and court hearings. There are sentences <clears throat> without virtually any attention from the public, same as the crimes about Maidan, we remember the first case of Shichimarin, who everybody followed, but then there's quite a lot of other stuff, and the society does not know about it. And of course, the attention is important, and patience is important, because for 999 .9 this work on investigating war crimes is the work of the national system of justice. And we have to understand that this will last for years, for decades, very long. But we, will, we have to be able, capable of uh, collecting data and of uh, being prepared to do this after 10 years or many more years to be able to provide this to courts. And even when we find suspects in uh, after decades, we will be able to document. Of course, 100% of uh, criminals won't be found and won't be punished, but the figure should be as high as possible. Thank you very much. 
I would like to say that about the civilian hostages because this is a very complicated situation. These are the first in uh, history, the mass detention and deportation of civilians and people are of different ages from 18 to pensioners and these people are being sentenced. One of them is Serhii Tsihipa, who's been sentenced, and they try to appeal now, but they cannot do this because uh, Russia does not accept any appeals. They are establishing their own rights. I would also like to say that I wish there was a mechanism, there were a mechanism, and there's no coordination center for doing this. However, there's no special department for working on uh, civilian hostages. And the civilians do not have as much time. Uh, we thought that the confirmation of the status of the captivity is um, key to for a person to be saved even on the territory of the Russian Federation. But we now understand that this is not necessarily happens because sometimes they return tortured bodies from captivity because people do not sustain, do not survive what is happening there. I think this is a very important comment on the perception of justice because there is no magic wand or any tool that can be used to bring people back swiftly. But of course, the expectation of uh, near of uh, relatives and friends for effective communication with state bodies is a justified expectation. And this should be provided for by the Ukrainian state. Yuri, would you like to add something? I also have something to tell about this topic. You know, this as a fight, as a struggle, and this is not just the fight against the aggressor country, this is a fight inside the country. Why? Because in captivity, you are fighting for a survival and coming back home. However, they do attain this by applying effort. Not everyone succeeds, and when a prisoner comes back, a civilian or a military person, however this may sound, this may sound brutally, but this person continues to fight here, not for their life, for their existence, in their own country, on their own land, but they continue to fight because many of us, those who came back, are not being paid attention to. No one accompanies us. If you agree to come back to the front line within a month, 
then you're being paid attention to, but if you are not able to come back there, then no one will pay attention to you until you start to talk about this. Regrettably, very regrettably, I have faced this, and not only I, I talked to very many people who have come back from captivity, both civilians and uh, the military who used their right to be released from being prisoners of war. And there are the military who continue to fight for Ukraine, but regrettably, we cannot say that 50 percent of uh, that our law enforcement bodies work at least for 50 percent of their capacity it's too much yes they work and i believe that they can work better than they do with uh, more results for ukrainians for those Ukrainians who have not been in captivity, for those Ukrainians who have come back from captivity, however, you know, we have become used to saying that we hope, and this is about hope. The hope as our Colleagues have said that humanity, human attitude will appear. And uh, I'm generalizing, of course, but I can also be very much specific. When I came back from captivity in April until June, I was missing in action. And when I contacted my military unit, and this was two days after I was released from captivity, I returned, they told me, you are missing in action, and they have not contacted me again. So the question is, maybe we should have more strength to fight not only the aggressor country, but also the indifference to you. When you come back from torture, when you are broken, and then I heard someone saying that I am a traitor. Why am I a traitor? Because under the barrel of automated rifle, I was treating not only civilians, not only Ukrainian military who were taken prisoners, but also I was forced to help the Russian military. And that's why I became a traitor. And I had to tell many people very many people, how this happened. This does not per pertain to our special services, like state security service, like security service. No one there told me like uh, this, but my direct commander said that I was a traitor. The legal representatives of the military unit also played a huge role. And now, although I do not want to see this, I am still engaged in fighting in the court procedure, procedure proceedings. Although, you know, when I was in captivity, I was so I so believed, and I thanked God for the fact that I was a military person because I saw how military exchanges take place, and I understood that I will get home, and I only need some 
time and uh, believe that I'm being expected by someone. But you know, when I finally found myself at home, instead of being treated and cured, I was going to the prosecutor's office, to the court. I was hiring lawyers who were defended me. So I am sure and I believe and I want to believe that anyway they'll gather their strength and we will fight together. I do not believe that we don't have people who pay attention to this. I do not want to believe this. This is Ukraine and we are Ukrainians. Thank you very much, Yuri, and I think that this is very important, a very important addition to your story, which shows the personal dimension of uh, fighting for justice and those numerous ways that we were, that we started to war, talk about, that we do not have a liner answer to this. And we have to look for the way for justice in many ways. We are very close to the exhaustion of our time, but I also would like other participants to laconically talk about the ways to justice. Yes, I would like to add something about the deportation of people. Uh, during this Soviet time, there were special textbooks by the KGB, which were classified first grade about the fight, struggle about Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists. And they, from their point of view, very logically, have written about how this could be done and how to break the way to resistance. And this happens now when Ukrainian people are being deported, when children are put in camps on the territory of the Russian Federation and they start to put them through propaganda and they do not see anything uh, pertaining to the coming, uh, sending these people back. They want to brainwash these people and not to return them. Justice is important for us and for our international partners. We have to make the Russian Federation understand that there are ways to justice and it has to adhere to international norms and think about the justice that the entire world will demand from it. Thank you. I'll try to be laconic, but the stories, you know, we're talking about alternative mechanisms that you mentioned, but you know, the gravest international crimes are not about alternative ways. If we're talking about legal assessment of those who remained on the occupied territories, the issue of state policy is very important. It is important that it is balanced and that there's responsibility for the gravest international crimes and of course, there's the issue of regulating the bringing into responsibility for crimes and also the legal assessment and about communication of these uh, limits to the people in uh, occupied territories. This is very important and this shows how the communication is important. The situation that colleagues have mentioned that even during the Second World War, we have not worked 
about uh, on this. No one was punished for the genocide crimes and the Holodomor crime and the deportation crime, but we were talking about collaborators and traitors. And those whom we talked from uh, other countries, I have not heard even a single time that they felt that the justice was restored. I mean, people from those post-conflict territories, but I think that Ukrainians are different in this way. We will be uh, striving at uh, restoring justice. We, however, were against it in 2014 because uh, brutality in return for brutality is not our value, and we have shown this. So what we are fighting for now is the continuation of the fight that we were fighting then. It is hard for me to choose words after so many different thoughts and ideas. To sum up our discussion, I'd say that because the full-scale invasion is the Russian answer to the continuation of European civilization way of Ukraine. So our response should be the same following, the same ideals and values. If we have chosen to be on the side of civilization, then our way to restore justice through truth, through law, through certain procedures, will make us stronger and will allow us not to betray ourselves. Because for us, there's no other way. This is the only way that we have left. Thank you. So we have exhausted our time. I think that this was a very productive and interesting discussion from different points of view. And the only conclusion that I would like to draw from all this is that, regrettably, this brutality and these crimes are going on, and the world, even United, cannot do nothing, cannot do anything to this, because there's an intention to commit those crimes. And no one can say that there's a universal way, way to how this can be stopped and how this injustice can be transferred, transformed into justice. But we can allow ourselves to think of our intention to fight it as justice. So every person who took part in this conversation does have their own fight, different dimensions, different forms. It is important that it does not stop and the uh, Unification of these vectors is the only thing that we can oppose with to the brutal evil that attacks us. However, it has not reached, attained its primary intention because it met unbelievable resistance on Ukrainian soil in the person of the Ukrainian nation. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, for your interest in our today's conversation. Till we meet again.